I'm going to be uh, talking about what democracy is and actually what did we do? What did we, what did we do? And what is it that's, what is the international or donor dimension of this backlash against democracy? And why do we see this backlash against democracy from the donor side? <coughs> and I'm going to be arguing in this 15 minutes that part of the reason for that is that we conflated governance with democracy. And I'm going to end kind of on a normative note with a plea for all of us in, as researchers and in the international donor community to actually continue or to beef up democracy assistance for the sake of democracy. So that's what I'm going to be doing. This is where we start. This was 19, Berlin Wall fell in 1989. Seems like, well, it was a different century, <laughs> a different, different millennia. And that's what it feels like. Um, times were extremely optimistic, also in the donor community, in terms of what democracy assistance could do and could accomplish for democracy at large. I think we have to remember that this was, it's, it was a very, very short period. And I think the period is over. And it was very significant. I mean, we saw a significant rise in democracy assistance and support to democracy around the world. So of, of course, the, the European accession uh, policies were the most important, but also in sub-Saharan Africa. And I think, yes, some of it was very naive. And this idea that we had sort of reached, like the most naive is, of course, Francis Fukuyama, who's long retracted this statement, of course. But, you know, there you go. If you published it, you published it. And um, it, the world was not, did not, this is not where we ended. And just to sort of, and exactly as Danielle was saying in terms of our project some years ago, for a long time, we've been grappling with this idea that democracy is just going one way. You know, you avoid an erosion, you avoid a coup, you go from a transition period, and then at some point it institutionalizes and it becomes consolidated. And this idea that, the, you know, it's going in one direction, and or that's, that was very, very strong at this time. That was a very, very significant, and which has really been informing a lot of the theories that we've been working with, which, of course, now has to change. So, before we go into the democratic, the backlash against democracy or democratic erosion, what do we actually know about, uh, about democracy assistance as such? I think, first of all, I want to say we know quite a bit. There has been a lot of research in the area of the effects of democracy assistance. If I was going to be a little bit coy, I could say that considering the amount of money in terms of the total aid budget, the amount of money that's going to democracy aid, it's amazing how it has been scrutinized and how it has been evaluated and how critically it has been evaluated. Considering the minuscule part of, you know, economic part it is of the entire aid budget. But actually, so we do, we do know a lot and we have worked, we have looked at this a lot. But having said that, it's also hard, it's enormously hard to evaluate the effects of democracy assistance. First of all, you know, it, it is interchanged with everything else. But even if you try to isolate that, let's say, um, you know, you evaluate democracy assistance to a country. So, okay, parliamentary politics are really going down the drain. The parliament, uh, you know, the, the parliament is sort of its sideline in every discussion. On the other hand, elections are going forward or the media, uh, support to media is going forward. So how do you evaluate that? The thing with democracy, it doesn't move in a straightforward direction, which makes it really difficult to evaluate. And I think that's, you know, the enormous amount of evaluation carried out and the complexity of it is something that I think we maybe haven't considered enough. I would argue that it has worked and it, it does work. It works when it's long-term, well-designed and owned by the partners. That includes the international donors. Um, so basically, it's really about sticking to the guns. But 
as uh, Sarah Bush's book so eloquently put it, it has, it didn't tame dictators, it doesn't tame dictators. I don't think democracy or democracy system necessarily solves corruption. And I think we have to realize that this is the goal. The goal of democracy is the goal that gives when it comes into conflict with something else as development. I think this is one of the key, these are some of the key findings from our, our book some years back. So then don't think that you need to read this. This is just kind of an illustration of the various terms that we use out there. So is it uh, de -author, you know, deconsolidation? Is it erosion? Is it backsliding? Is it backlash? Is it, uh, what are the terms? We, there's a lot of argument out there. Well, what is it that we are seeing now? First of all, I think I, I just want to say that what we're looking at in the world today is a very, very different kind of uh, sort of a democratic backlash or every, because it doesn't really happen as, you know, where, you know, as, as in 1974 with a military coup or something. It, it's a very much of a sort of a slow, pro, slow burning process and where some elements of democracy may thrive and others are sort of systematically undermined. What I am focusing on, and which is the, the far right corner, which is our, the research that we are focusing on, is a little bit more specific, because we're looking at specific, deliberate attempts to, you know, to actually roll back or reduce democratic rights gained by political elites. So we're not really looking at attitudinal data, we're looking at political elites and how they work to sort of uh, deliberately uh, um, sort of take away democratic rights gained. And in this game, international donors play both an active and a passive part. So that's what I will be, be talking a bit about now. So this is, uh, okay, so here's the data. You all know this. You all know the IDEA reports, the VDEM data, Freedom House, you know, seventh or eighth year in a row, you know, showing a democratic decline in the world. Well, I spent the last year looking at this data for Africa, looking at about, what is it, like 38 different data sets on different dimensions of democracy, look, you know, uh, evaluating or measuring democracy. So what I want to say is that in terms of Africa, we actually know surprisingly, the data is surprisingly weak. There are so many gray zones and so many countries, so many African countries that are not part of these global data sets for, and, and there are so many sort of, you know, basically gray areas. And that's one big issue for us working on Africa. The other is that the data is going in many different directions. There are some countries performing better. Some countries are clearly, both <laughs> democracy is eroding and there are serious attempts to, you know, really erode the rights of people from governments. And then we see, uh, but it, it's also when democracy is decomposed into its sort of various rights dimension, we see it more clearly. So I think elections, I'm not going to talk a lot about that because Nick's coming after me. Uh, this is an area that's been clearly maybe the most institutionalized. It's also the area of democracy where international donors have been the most involved. And I think there's a book coming out now, Electoral Politics in Africa since 1990, by uh, Jamie and Nick Vanderbilt, who is also part of this project, that actually show the data book shows that stagnation is probably more the general perspective than a backlash or, you know, a, a kind of a move forward. But again, that's when you put all, you know, all of Africa together. I think one of the real issues here is the effects on NGOs and organizational rights. Um, this is an area where we really see a very deliberate attempt to take away rights that have been granted. And it is, I'm just giving uh, examples from four countries, different ways of targeting NGOs. NGOs that were formed in the, you know, in the aftermath and as part of this democracy assistance. 
What is very noticeable in the data that I, we've been collecting for, our, for this research project is that we're talking about NGOs. We're really not talking about civil society. We're not, it's not the churches. It's not necessarily the trade unions, the teachers' unions, the economics associations. Sometimes it's the law society in the case of Zambia. We could talk more about that. But it's very much the NGOs, the civil society entity that was born in the, you know, in the democracy assistant era in the, in the 1990s. These are the organizations attacked by the new laws. And it has a great effect. This new study came uh, from a, a, a colleague of mine, Kendra Dupuy and uh, Asim Prakash, shows that there is actually, when these laws are implemented, aid is reduced by 32%. And why is that? Because so much of democracy assistance, so much aid is channeled through civil society. And so this is like, it's, you know, this becomes game over in many, many instances in terms of development aid. So this is a very conscious strategy. And this is where we really see a democratic backlash. Another element that's not very much talked about and that worries me, and this is where Africa comes out <coughs> with the most gray spots and is as, as really neglected in global data set, is on judicial independence, the role of courts. To me, this is probably where the battle over democracy is going to stand in the next, you know, in the next decade. And I really worry that, first of all, it's not, Africa is not well equipped in this regard. Uh, there, is, there is so little funding going into the judiciary, there's so weak training, it's politicized. And also, we lack really, we really lack good data on this one. So, moving then to what is then this international dimension? I think it is fair to say that there is a strong sense of an African democracy fatigue in the international donor community. I'm challenging Verena on that, you've been working on this for, so if, if I'm right about that, that's my sense. And my other sense is that the Millennium Development Goals really changed the way we think about democracy. And, and, and even aid to, aid to governance became very technocratic and a, a dialogue of rights and human rights and, and political reform was replaced by a more sort of efficiency report uh, and this sort of a culture of efficiency and, you know, like the Rwandan civic uh, uh, service that had this culture of efficiency, that became, you know, a governance and, and then an argument for giving democracy support. And I think then it is fair to say, and I hear I'm quoting uh, Rita Abrahamson's book saying that donors have become complicit in kind of fostering a development without democracy. And I think we can say that democracy has become uh, technocratic in a sense. So um, why, why, is this, why has this happened? Well, I'm putting up, this is my, so I'm doing actually quite well on time, Daniel. Uh, I think this is part of the problem. And I think this is where I want to sort of end my presentation. The problem is, and it goes back to 1990s, because it really never was about democracy. It was about governance. And it was about, there was political conditionality and there was economic conditionality. And the, the economic aspect was what dealt with the governance aspect. And the countries we've known from early 90s, countries receiving aid could always play these up against each other. I think that, that was the biggest problem made, was that democracy was conflated with governance. I don't think that we should expect that democracy, dem uh, dem necessarily, e rule of law, elections, uh, free media and civil society, these are all incredibly important elements for checking government. But democracy as a kind of a mechanism for solving other development issues, I think that's where we went wrong. That democracy didn't become a value in and of itself. It was a means for something else. And when that mean, and we didn't reach that mean, you know, there wasn't less corruption or, you know, then, you know, it was the fault of democracy. And I think this is where we need to start a new discussion. 
And we need to start a new discussion about the value of democracy in and of itself. And we need to do that not only for our development aid, but we need to do it for ourselves. I think Freedom House said it really well last year. When in the, in universal values and international law are cast aside, global affairs are governed by force. Democracy is important in our development work, in our daily lives. And I think we need to start a new debate and a new discussion on the value of democracy in and of itself. And that is where I want to end my talk. I promise I would end on a normative note. Um, thank you. Thanks for the time.